Lab exercise two is going to be kind of chemistry. We'll do macromolecules, how things transport across the cell membrane, which is basically osmosis or semi-permeable membrane. And one of the easiest things to do to remember macromolecules is simply pick up something that you eat or something that you drink, and the macromolecules will be written on the side of the bottle. This should look familiar to you. Here is the fat, and it breaks it down into cholesterol, saturated fats, and trans fats, carbohydrates, and proteins. Your macromolecules are going to be proteins, carbohydrates, lipids, which is fats, and nucleic acids. Since all plants and animals have nucleic acids, they don't have to put that on the label. So unless you're eating chalk or dirt or something, you're going to be getting plenty of nucleic acids. But they have to tell you how much proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids you give. Here's a list of the objectives. And one of the things it says is you have to know the monomers, which are the basis for the organic macromolecules. So that sounds like a whole bunch of big words, but basically they're wanting to know what are the building blocks for each of those macromolecules. So proteins are made of amino acids. Carbohydrates are made of sugars. Lipids are forms of fats and waxes. And nucleic acids are DNA, RNA, and then things like ATP. And we study ATP in the next chapter when we do cells. We learn about mitochondria that make the ATP energy. But it is also classified as a nucleic acid. So a monomer is one piece, like one amino acid. A polymer is where you put together a few. So if you take several amino acids and put them together, you have what we call a peptide. So we talk about peptides in uh, Biology 139 when we're looking at neurotransmitters and when we're looking at hormones because they tend to be just a few amino acids big. But if you put a whole lot of amino acids together, then you're going to get really large proteins. And we use these for structure and support, uh, for movement, contraction of our muscles, all sorts of things like that. The word organic in the, in the sense of what we're doing means that it's made of carbon. So if you're talking about organic, when you're talking about vegetables or fruits that you buy at the market, it means they haven't been sprayed with pesticide. But when we talk about organic here, we're talking about compounds that contain carbon. In a minute, I'm going to tell you about the test that they have to see if a certain compound has macromolecules, if it has proteins in it, if it has fats in it. So we have various tests that we're going to do in the laboratory that we're going to see whether or not they contain these particular molecules. And then we're going to talk about Brownian motion. Brownian motion is fascinating. Some guy named Brown saw everything is in motion. So he said, oh, we're going to call it Brownian motion and name it after himself. But What's really interesting is the amount of motion you get varies by temperature. And so if you actually could get down to absolute zero, so you just get colder and colder and colder and colder, then you're going to get to where we are almost at absolute zero. We haven't gotten there yet, but we've gotten awfully close. And at absolute zero, all motion stops. And then all of the physics and all the laws and things like gravity, and they stop working. So it's really interesting. So as these molecules are moving around, whether you're talking about particles moving in the air, like soot coming around and, and moving through the air, you can actually see that smog or um, putting Kool-Aid into a glass of water 
and stirring. You can actually see the colored particles moving around and changing the water into a colored liquid. So one of the things we're going to look at is factors that influence the rate of diffusion. And the third thing that we're going to do in lab is we're going to learn about osmosis. So we have some experiments we can do to look at how things move through semi-permeable membranes, which means that things like water can move through the membrane, but the things that are inside and outside the membrane can't easily move across the membrane. So water is going to go wherever there's more stuff. We're going to learn about that. Here's a nice little table that tells you the monomers that make up the four macromolecules. The only thing that's a little bit confusing is when they say monosaccharides make up carbohydrates. In your mind, I mean, learn monosaccharides, it means one sugar. But think about glucose, dextrose, fructose. These, these are the sugars that make up carbohydrates. We're most familiar with glucose. Although keep in mind that people in other countries don't call it glucose, they call it dextrose. If you were to take monosaccharides or single sugars and join them to another one and make a daisy chain of one sugar, one sugar, one sugar, and you've bonded them, you've chemically bonded them with a covalent bond, a dehydration synthesis, then you're going to build starches if you're a tree or a plant, and you're going to build glycogen if you're a human being like us. So pretty much the same name for long polymers of glucose. But depending on whether it's made by a plant or an animal, we give it a different name. Uh, I already said the amino acids make up proteins or 20 amino acids. And then lipids, you have fatty acids that make up a lot of lipids, but there are waxes, like that stuff you get out of your ear, that's, that's a lipid. And uh, cholesterol, you know how they go on and on about cholesterol? So hopefully when you get into anatomy too, they'll teach you that cholesterol is not bad. It is actually essential because if you don't have cholesterol, you can't make your hormones like estrogen and testosterone because those are forms of cholesterol. So cholesterol gets a bad rap. Uh, but if you have too much of anything, you know, it's, it's not okay. A lot of your carbohydrates end in OSE, like dextrose, glucose, maltose. And then it says that proteins end in ASE, and that's not exactly true. The, the enzymes, proteins that make up enzymes, those end in ASE. That's the ending for um, an enzyme. But there are all kinds of proteins. We're going to learn about actin and myosin in a, a few chapters from now. In chapter 3, we're going to learn about phospholipid bilayer. And you'll be surprised to find out that your cells are actually made of fats. A lot of people think that your cells and your skin are made of protein. And actually, here's the label, the nutrition label, for pork skins. Uh, we used to call them pork rinds. And I know that it's, they're also called chicarones. I can't pronounce that very well, but that's the best I can come up with. Anyway, if you look, it says they the pork skin, so they've taken the skin off of a pig, and they have baked it, and so it puffs up, and you can buy it like potato chips. And it says, not a significant source of protein. So that was that's always a surprise to students, because they're like, no, no, it's, it's made of protein. So it's like, no, no. It's actually made of phospholipid bilayers, which is fat. We're going to do two chemical analyses and look and see if we can detect starch, which would be the polysaccharides, and biuret, which is going to uh, look for proteins. Now, I think this is funny because you have to read on, but it says if you test a paper towel for lipids, you're like, okay, paper towels 
are wood fibers. So they're not going to have lipids. But what you're going to do is you're going to take a potato chip and put it in the paper towel. So anyway, when I was reading that, I was like, what? I'm going to show you a video of somebody doing an iodine test for starch. And they're also going to look at glycogen. So remember, starch is plants, glycogen is animals, but it's both just strings of, of glucose. And then the biuret test is a chemical test that w is looking for proteins, not amino acids, but the whole proteins where you put amino acids together using peptide bonds. Second lab in our carbohydrate identification series. In this lab, we'll add iodine to some solutions. It is a test for polysaccharides. If polysaccharides are present, there will be a significant color change. We add two drops to half a mil of each solution. Here we have our negative control, our water, positive control, starch, and another positive control, glycogen. Notice the significant color change between the negative control and starch and glycogen. Let's now test our samples. Sample one. Sample two. Sample three. As you see from the video clips that I just showed you, it's easy to tell a positive test for starch glycogen because it turns black. So the iodine will turn black. You may have seen iodine if you've ever had um, surgery or um, assisted in an operation of any sort. They take betadine, which is a form of iodine, and they rub it on your skin and it kills off any bacteria that you have and it prevents you from getting infection in the area where they're going to be doing surgery. I remember the first time I had an operation and I woke up, I wanted to see how big my scar was and I lifted up my sheets and they had painted me with iodine and it freaked me out because I thought it was dried blood everywhere. So anyway, but it was negative for starch and glycogen. So I didn't have starch or glycogen on my skin. I left the chemical reaction on the end of that little video clip about how to do the biuret and what it looks like. What you need to remember is if protein is present, it turns purple. So positive protein is purple. Keep those P's rolling out there. Otherwise, it just stays blue. So the biuret reagent is actually a blue color. You are going to take seven pieces of paper towel, just a little bit bigger than postage stamp size, and you're going to put one of seven samples. On one of them, you're going to put a potato chip. Another one, you're going to put some drops of milk. Another, you're going to put a clear soda like 7-Up or Sprite. And then one's just going to be like a control, and it's just going to have water in it. Then you have a sample of bread, cheese, and potato. So those are your seven samples that you're going to be testing. And if you've ever taken a paper towel and lined a basket and then filled it up with chips of some sort, you come back after you've eaten the chips and the paper towel has soaked up a bunch of grease. If you're watching this video, it's usually because you've missed class and so you're trying to play catch up. Or it could be that you want to review.
So for either reason, that's fine. You should be able to figure out the results of what you would expect to find. For example, you know that potato chips, potatoes, are very starchy. So you should definitely get a positive test for a potato chip. Milk, you may have to look that one up and see how much milk, uh, if, if there's any starch or glycogen in milk. There's definitely milk sugar. So milk itself has sugars in it. But are they long enough to trip the test for starch? <laughs> अपने ना आयोडीन ड्रॉप्स देख के नहीं, टू टेस्ट ट्यूब्स लो आयोडीन ऐड जास के नानो, अब जोर जाएंगे। शेक जास के नानो, स्टार्च ना मिल्क की, नॉर्मल मिल्क की डिफरेंस छोड़ देंगे। इट शुड बी ऑब्वियस दैट ब्रेड एंड पोटैटोस आर गोइंग टू बी स्टार्ची, एंड इट शुड बी ऑब्वियस that potato chips, which are fried in grease, will be greasy. But it's a surprise if you have a piece of cheese and you leave it on a paper towel and you see the grease coming out of the cheese. Most people don't realize that. You know that cheese is made out of milk and you know that milk has fat in it because you can buy whole milk or you can buy 2% milk. Now, there is a misconception. You think that whole milk would be 100%, but that would mean it was 100% fat. And whole milk is about 4% fat. So when you get 2% milk, they've taken out half of the fat that was there. So they've gone from 4% down to 2%. So a lot of people are surprised to find out that it doesn't take out... 98% of the fat. As I mentioned earlier about brownie in motion, if the air is warm or the liquid is warm, you're going to speed up the diffusion or the spreading of the particles. And the colder you get, the less motion you're going to get until you get to absolute zero and all motion stops. You should easily be able to answer the question if you have one solution at 37 degrees and you've got little particles moving around and you've got another one at 34 degrees with particles moving around, you're going to see more motion at the higher temperature. The definition for diffusion is going from high concentration to low concentration. A classic example, you put some perfume on where you are on your neck or your face, where you sprayed the perfume, it's going to be the highest concentration and it's going to smell stronger there. As it diffuses away from your neck, then people nearby can smell your perfume or your cologne or your aftershave. So you go from a high concentration and it diffuses out into a low concentration. Other factors that are going to influence the rate of diffusion besides temperature are if you have smaller particles, they're going to be able to move more quickly because they don't weigh as much. Another one is if you have an increased concentration. So if I spill the perfume on myself, I now have a very high concentration and the smell is going to spread quickly. So people are going to notice that I'm putting on way too much perfume as opposed to if I just sprayed a little bit on and then you have to kind of get close to me and get a little whiff of my uh, eau de toilette. You can do this experiment at home. Just get a glass of water and put a drop of food coloring in it and watch the food coloring spread out from a high concentration of the drop to where it diffuses out and eventually your glass is all of a uniform color after it's finished diffusing and reaches equilibrium. In chapter three, we're going to talk about how a cell membrane is formed. It's a phospholipid bilayer, which means that the outside likes water 
and the middle of the membrane does not like water. Here's a picture from Wikipedia showing facilitated diffusion, but it also shows, if you look, this purple stuff right here, the lighter purple stuff, as opposed to the darker purple stuff, this is supposed to show you the fatty layer that makes up the phospholipid bilayer. Lipid means fat. So it's a bilayer. You can see one layer right here and one layer right here. So for some things to get in and out of the cell, they're going to have to have something that will help them pass this fat because some things don't like to dissolve in fat. So we have these little uh, proteins that allow some of these things to be transported. I kind of think of it like a ferry boat and you're trying to get across the water. Well, in this case, you're trying to get across a layer of, of hydrophobic fat. This selectivity of the membrane to allow some things in and some things not come in it is going to be very important for the homeostasis or the way that the cell behaves. Our next experiment in lab takes into account this selective permeability and hopefully it'll help you understand this concept of diffusion across a semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. We have a special name for the special passing of just water through the selectively or semi-permeable membrane. And it's called osmosis. So osmosis, you're going to have water going from an area of high concentration to low concentration. But trying to remember that Sometimes it's confusing. So if you can remember that water is going to go where there's more stuff, kind of like Bounty, the quicker picker upper, it's going to suck the water up. So if there's more stuff, it'll suck up the water. That kind of helps you uh, put this into perspective. All right. Three words you need to know are hypotonic, hypertonic, and isotonic. So let's spend just a second talking about what the stuff is that I'm talking about when I'm talking about the semi-permeable or selectively permeable membrane. So again, next, semester, next uh, chapter, you're going to learn about all the cell organelles, such as ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, mitochondria. You're going to learn the nucleus and the DNA. All of that stuff is inside the cell. So I, we just collectively, or I collectively call it stuff. And then outside the cell, you also have stuff. So you've got um, sodium and magnesium, calcium. So you've got all sorts of uh, molecules outside. And then you have the food that's being brought into the cell so you can eat it. And the waste that are being dumped outside the cell. So you can have nitrogen waste that are coming outside the cell that you need to clean up. So that's one of the things that we do throughout the semester is we talk about how different systems carry out their functions. If you get the concept of osmosis right now, then every chapter when they're talking about osmosis, everything will make sense to you. So spend time and make sure you've totally got the term osmosis and you can see it in your mind. So the way I do it is, uh, let's see. Well, I actually start out with a slug. So if you've ever seen a slug, it looks like a snail, except for it doesn't have a shell. And a lot of people do not like them in their garden because they run along your vegetables and your plants and they eat them. So they ruin your plants and then they leave a slimy trail behind. So people really just don't care for them. So what you can do is you can take a salt shaker and you can go outside and sprinkle salt on the slug. And it looks like the slug melts. But what happens is you're putting more stuff outside the slug that is inside the slug. 
So inside the slug, it's got cells, and it has the mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus and all of those other things inside the slug. Outside the slug, what you just did is you just put salt. So you have so much salt on the outside of the slug that it literally sucks the water right out of the slug. So it appears that the slug is melting when actually what you're doing is just sucking the water out of it. So it's a quick way to get rid of a slug. In the case of the slug and the salt, the slug itself was hypotonic. It didn't have as much stuff. And the salt that you dumped on the outside was hypertonic because it had more stuff. So it's not important what the stuff is. It's just which molecules, it, which you have more on the inside or more on the outside. When you get into looking at people's blood, this is one of the places where osmosis is really important. You know, when you're giving people IVs to rehydrate them. So if you look at a regular cell, just a regular red blood cell, it's ejected its nucleus. So it actually looks concave. There, it looks, there's a little dip going on right there. So that's what a normal cell would look like. And this is in an isotonic solution. So there's the same amount of stuff inside that red blood cell as there is outside that red blood cell. So the water isn't rushing inside or rushing outside the cell. So it maintains its shape. Now, if you were to put that cell into an, a hypertonic solution, now you've got a lot of stuff, because that's what hypertonic means. It's got a lot of stuff outside the cell, and so it's going to suck the water right out of the cell. So look how this cell over here has shriveled up, and it has these things sticking out. Well, when we look at the cell and the structure of the cell, you're going to learn about microtubules and other proteins that hold the cell in its shape. Kind of like if, a, if you're looking at a tent and something happened and the, maybe water got on the tent and it starts collapsing in, then what you're seeing is the tent, but you're seeing the tent holes. The things that were normally holding the tent out so now as it starts to collapse, then you see the poles more easily. So these are the proteins that were actually the structure of the cell. And look how much smaller this cell is than this cell. So you've sucked the water out, and it is, we call this crenated. There's a special name specifically for that. C-R-E-A-N-A-T-E-D, crenated. All right. Now, if you go the other way and you drop that same cell over here, this is isotonic, and you put it into like a glass of water. Well, there's not much stuff in a glass of water. There's a little chlorine, maybe a little fluorine, you know, a little bit of something, but nothing compared to what's inside the cell. Because inside the red blood cell, besides the organelles that you have, the mitochondria and the nucleus and all that, you also have hemoglobin. You know, the red stuff that, that carries oxygen. You'll learn about that next semester. But anyway, so in that case, the cell is hypertonic because it's got a lot of stuff inside of it. And the water on the outside is hypotonic because it doesn't have stuff in it. So what's going to happen is the water is going to rush in and try to dilute the hypertonic. If we continue looking at blood cells and talking about hypertonic and hypotonic, it maybe will help you visualize when you take a patient who's dehydrated. They come in because they've been vomiting, they have diarrhea, and they're, they're just a mess. And if you don't do something, they actually could lose so much fluid in their body that they go into hypovolemic shock and they die. So... It's important if somebody is getting super dehydrated because they're peeing out or, or vomiting out or pooping out all of their fluids, you need to put fluids back in them. So you think, well, I'm just going to hook them up to an IV of water. 
Well, you can't do that. You can't hook them up to an IV of water because the water is hypotonic. And if you do that, the patient's red blood cells and other cells in their body will explode, literally explode. They'll just fill up with fluid and pop because they're made of phospholipid bilayers. They're made of fat. So they're, they're actually really fragile, surprisingly fragile. So I'm going to have to add stuff to the IV that I give this person. And it needs to be not the same stuff that's inside the cell, but equal molecules inside and out. So I can use salt and I can start a normal saline IV. Or if the person hasn't been able to hold down food, maybe I'll start a, a dextrose or a glucose drip. So I'm giving them the fluids that they need, but I'm also giving them sugar so that they have nutrients in their body. Sometimes the person's just a mess. They've been so sick for so long, they've lost their electrolytes. And so I'm going to give them a more complicated IV. So some of the ones that come to mind, ringers, you've got, you can add any kind of stuff in there that the patient needs. You can add uh, magnesium and calcium, potassium. So you can make up whatever you, you need to make the patient get rehydrated, but you can't just give them an IV of water because that's hypotonic and it will destroy their cells. The osmosis experiment that we're actually going to do in lab is to take dialysis tubing which is going to simulate the semi-permeable membrane. And then we're going to have beakers of fluid. And inside the beakers, one of them is going to have no sugar. So that's going to be the 0% sucrose. One of them is going to have 40% sucrose. That is way, way thick. Way There's a whole lot of solute. We call it solute. Dissolved stuff inside of that solution so that's going to be really hypertonic so you should be able already to tell what's going to happen in that one so the instructor will fill the dialysis bag and let me just show you that so here's somebody taking dialysis tubing and tying off one end of it now this is a little bit like if you go in the grocery store and you get those bags that you want to put your fruit in. You know how annoying it is when you try to open the end of the bag. So this is going to be funny watching him in a minute try to open the bag. I usually say a few trust words when I'm doing it. All right. Here he goes. Now he's rubbing, rubbing, trying to get the end open. Trying to get the end open. Trying to get the end open. <laughs> oh, it didn't take him nearly as long as it takes me. Okay, now we're going to put something inside there. So we're going to set up uh, at least two different situations. So one of them, we're going to put just water inside the bag. So it's going to be hypotonic inside the bag because it's just water. So here he is filling it up trying to get it in there and then he's going to seal it off and we're going to see what happens now if i put that bag of water in a in a beaker that has water nothing's going to happen because it's isotonic there's the same amount of stuff outside as there is inside so he's about filled it up here and he's going to uh, tie off the end and then you're going to weigh it. So this is a balance. And it's just like your bathroom scales. you got to set it to zero first. Okay, once you got it set to zero, then you're going to put that dialysis tubing on it. There it is. So it has a certain amount of fluid inside of it. And we write down what the weight is. So once you've weighed it, you've put it into a beaker. We're going to put one that has water inside the tube and water outside. So we're going to see 40 minutes later. OK, 
And now we're going to repeat this again. We're going to take a tube of dialysis tubing and we're going to fill it with 40% sucrose and we're going to put that in the water. So if you look at that, the 40% sucrose is the hyper, excuse me, yeah, hypertonic and the water on the outside is going to be hypotonic. So you should be able to predict what's going to go on with the hypertonic inside with 40% sucrose. Put in a beaker with just water. It should, the water, rush into the dialysis tubing. So it should get much, much heavier because you're filling it up with water. So you weigh it when you fill it up, then you put it in and see what happens. Now, if we put 40% sucrose inside the tubing and 40% sucrose outside the tubing, then we should have an isotonic situation and the weight shouldn't change. So the other permutation that we could do is we could take a tube of water and drop it down into a beaker that has 40% sucrose. Now the tube is hypertonic, nope, nope, hypotonic, not enough, hypotonic, because there's nothing in there, the water. And outside is the 40% sucrose, so it is hypertonic, hypertonic, and water always goes in the hypertonic direction or where there's more stuff so there's a lot more sugar outside than there is inside so the, it'll suck the water right out of the bag so we weigh the bag we put it in the sucrose and we watch and you'll see the bag shrivel up because you suck the water out of it and then when you weigh it you'll find it weighs much less you should fill out this table. Make sure you understand what's going on. If you have 40% sucrose in the dialysis bag and no sucrose in the beaker, then the dialysis bag is hypertonic. The sucrose is hypotonic. And so you should figure out what the weight is at the beginning, what the weight is at the end, and will this be a positive or negative change? Will the bag fill up? Or will the bag empty out? Will it be sucked out? Well, in this case, you got more stuff inside the bag, so the water should go inside the bag. Remember, that's the way this works. The water goes where there's more stuff. So there's a lot more stuff in the bag than there is in the beaker. All right? In this situation, there is no sucrose inside the bag. And outside the bag, you have 40% sucrose. So it's going to suck the water out of the bag, trying to dilute this 40%. Okay? So you have to tell which one is isotonic, which one is hypotonic, and which one is hypertonic. But a lot of people get it confused because they don't realize. They go, well, this is the hypertonic. Oh, wait a minute. No, this is the hypertonic. Well, this is hypertonic in the bag and hypotonic outside the bag. So you got to have both. You have to have one that's got too much and one that doesn't have enough. So in this case, the beaker is hypertonic and the bag is hypotonic. In this case, they both have the same amount, so they're both isotonic. So go over that, read it in your book, uh, watch YouTube videos about it if you don't understand it. But if you can remember that water goes towards the stuff and the stuff is hypertonic, then you're golden. That, that's pretty much the way I remember it. All right. So here's you a question. I'm not going to give you the answer to this one. You're going to have to figure this one out. But you have A and B. And one of them, you're going to put 30% in A, you're going to put 30% sodium chloride. And in B, you're going to put 20% sodium chloride. So you got to figure out which one's hypotonic, which one's hypertonic, and which way will the water go.
The next term you need to understand is filtration. And you already understand filtration because probably every single one of you has either made coffee or watched somebody make coffee. So you put the ground up coffee in a coffee filter. So you got a lot of stuff there. And you're going to pour water through it. And as you pour the water through it, it's going to dissolve some of the caffeine and the good old coffee flavor. And so what comes out through the filter paper is the, the water that came in, but it's carrying with it flavor and it's carrying with it caffeine, which is what we're probably looking for when we're going for our coffee. Um, another example of filtration would be like the gold rush. So the people would go out with a kind of a like a colander or a sieve and they would take some of the sand out of the bottom of a creek bed or along the uh, riverbed and put it in there and then they would shake it and the sand and the dirt and the mud and the water would all filter out. And the hopes were that big chunks of gold would remain inside of your filtration unit. So you'd see people, they call it panning for gold. They had a pan with little holes in it. Where this is going to be important later on is we have all these waste that build up in our body, and we've got to get rid of the waste. So if they're inside of our GI tract, we just poop them out. But if they're inside of our blood, if they're inside of our interstitial fluid in between the cells, in between the tissues, we've got to get those waste out of our body. And so our kidneys are one of the things that we're using to do. And you'll be interested when you get into the chapter on kidneys. But one of the things, most people who die, unless they're hit by a train or something and die instantly, most people die of kidney failure. It could be kidney failure because they have COVID. It could be kidney failure because they have um, uh, cancer or their heart. they have heart failure. They have emphysema. There, there's usually something that causes toxic substances to build up in the body, and then the kidneys can't take care of it, and so you end up poisoning yourself. So most people die, actually, from their kidneys not working correctly. So we're going to spend some time talking about that. But you need to think about filtration. You need to think about semi-permeable membranes so that when you do get into the kidneys, you're like, oh, yeah, we studied that last semester. I got it. And the last thing you need to do is, here's a case study. So here's a guy who goes out in a boat, and he gets too far out because of a, a storm, and he can't get back to shore. He doesn't have water to drink. So as he gets thirstier and thirstier, he starts drinking the seawater. Well, the problem with that is the seawater has salt. It has stuff in it. And the guy has stuff in him. Well, in order for this filtration to work, in order for your kidneys to work, you need to get rid of salts. You get, need to get rid of urea. You need to get rid of these waste products in your body. So your kidneys aren't going to work if you don't get a hypertonic, hypotonic situation going. So we really haven't learned that yet, but it should kind of make a little bit of sense to you. So as you are drinking the seawater, you are you're adding more salt to your body. So now your kidneys are having to filter what's already in the body and the salts that you just drank. So over time, drinking seawater is going to kill you. But they caught this guy before he died. And they took him to the hospital, and then they were trying to get rid of all of the um, extra salts that he had, had drunk. But also, he didn't have other electrolytes. So we haven't really studied all the electrolytes, but you need potassium and calcium, and you need all kinds of stuff like that.
in your body besides just uh, salt, sodium. So anyway, research this. I'm not going to give you the answer to it because this is on you. But go, try to figure out what happens if you just drink salt water. What happens to your kidneys? What? Why would he have watery diarrhea? What's causing him to have diarrhea? Well, if you don't have any food that you've been eating, uh, then you can't really poop out substance because you really don't have substance to poop out. But see if you can figure out what's going on. Isotonic intravenous fluids are given to him. Isotonic, we need, remember, you can't, you can't just give him water. I mean, logically, that would seem the thing that you do, just give him water. But you can't do that because you'll blow up his red blood cells. They will lice. So you're going to have to give him isotonic. And it says that they're giving him the lost electrolytes. So part of the stuff that they're putting in the IV is going to be some of those electrolytes, some calcium, magnesium, zinc, and other things that he's lost as he was busy having this watery diarrhea and trying to pee out all the wet, the uh, salts that he was drinking. 